today we'll just do a couple examples of integrals with asymptotes in the way. All right. So why don't we just try one from the textbook. Okay, so for our next example, um, I'm going to give you a problem like this. We're going to go from 1 to infinity, e to the negative x squared dx. And if I give you this one, it's easy enough to realize, hey, that's improper, right? So you could maybe write this as a b on top, you know? You're just trying to stick to the rules, you know? Let's see here. Mr. Shore said no infinities at the top there, so I guess I'll put a b there. So you did the job, you converted it to proper, thank you. The problem is, you can try whatever you want on this integral, you're not going to be able to solve this thing. Uh, you could try parts, you could try uh, substitutions, you can try whatever. None of the methods work. There's just nothing there. So what does this mean? It means that we might not be able to answer this question completely. So I don't know that we can get the answer to what the area is. But maybe we can at least show that there is an answer. This is also important, you guys. Chapter 8-4 and almost all of Chapter 9, actually the only question is, is there an answer? Often we don't care about the answer in Chapter 9. We just want to know if there is one. So it's a little vague. How do you know there's an answer? OK, so let's think about this situation here for a minute. E to the minus x squared is the sombrero that we were dreaming about earlier. Okay, this is f equals e to the negative x squared. And we've been asked to find the area of this tail on the right. Problem is, it goes on forever. If I could find the antiderivative for you, I would show you that there is actually an area here. It's not infinite. But how do I do the antiderivative for you? I don't really know how. So here's my strategy, here's the thinking. Suppose I were to find another function that's actually higher up the page and prove to you that that had area. Okay? So here's the logic. I'm going to pick a function that's actually more like that. I'm going to actually choose a function. I'm going to prove to you that the green function has an area under it, and then that will force the purple function to have an area under it. Okay, it's a very simple logical argument. Okay, so here's an analogy. I have an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. I give you an 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper. On the piece of paper, I have a diagram so complicated and then I ask you to find the area. Okay? You're like, Mr. I don't even know what shape that is. I can barely even see the edges of it and stuff. How am I supposed to find the area for you? And then I say, yeah, you're right. It is kind of ugly, isn't it? You say, yeah, it's like the worst thing I've ever seen. What is it? It's, I have no idea. <laughs> it's endoplasmic reticulum <laughs> in a square cell wall. But listen, I could then switch the question and say, yeah, you can't find the area, but can you convince me that it has a finite area? Yes. That is an easy question to answer. How do you know that this has a finite area? It's and contained in something that has a finite area. area. It fits right on the paper. Yeah, if it had an infinite area, then no matter how you tried to recombine it, it would spill over the edge of the paper. In fact, it would fill the whole universe, like we said yesterday. So all you would have to say is, Mr. Shore, it fits on the paper. And the paper has area, and I can find the paper's area very easily. But you would have to find the paper's area to convince me that there was a finite amount of space. So that we're doing the exact same thing here. This is 100% exactly the same thing. We're going to pick a function g. Okay, We're going to show that it has area. And then since the purple one is beneath it, it too must have area. It's that simple. Okay? The hard part is picking G. All right? So let me write the theorem, and then I'll help you figure out how we're going to pick out what G is. Here's the basic rule in calculus wording. Okay? If you have a function, f of x, and it's a positive function, that means it's not in quadrant 4. 
and it's less than another function, and you happen to know that the integral for the upper function converges, that means it comes out to a number, then you can be 100% sure that your function converges as well. Your integral converges. So all you have to do is pick a G that goes on forever <laughs> that has a finite area. And since F is beneath it, it too will have a finite area. All right. Here's the hard part, picking out the G. OK, so write down this inequality like this. And this is E to the minus X squared. You could pick anything you want to put here. But here are the conditions. It has to be infinitely long. And it has to have area. It's tough. For example, if you pick 1 over x, that's actually a pretty good first guess. Watch. 1 over x, I uh, didn't draw that quite right. 1 over x looks like this. y equals 1 over x, is truly above this, because this means 1 over e to the x squared, right? 1 over e to the x squared. Isn't that what that means? So if you pick 1 over x right here, good job. You found a function that truly does live above the function you're interested in. Here's the problem. If you try to find the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x, it doesn't work. You get this, ln x from 1 to b, and then there's a limit as b goes to infinity. This explodes to infinity. This is how you know you picked a bad choice. Or maybe you're going to say, I know Mr. Shore. I could definitely tell you a function, Mr. Shore, that is above that purple function. Check this out. Check this out, Mr. Shore. I'm going to pick y equals 1. So this, is, this is e to the minus x squared. I'm going to pick y equals 1. Watch this. Here we go. Look at that. y equals 1. That is most definitely above your function, Mr. Shore. Yeah, but how are you planning to show me that if this goes on forever to the right, how are you planning to show me that this red thing has area? See the problem? So you, you satisfied one condition. You made it above, but you were not able to satisfy the rule that it pinches out of the finite area. So this is where it gets tricky, and it's very hard to pick a uh, G function. And a lot of students struggle with this. So here are my strategies. The first things I try when I'm guessing for a G function, OK? To guess a G function, I always pick something that looks similar to my F function. For example, I wouldn't pick 1 over X. That's a totally different style of function. I would probably pick 1 over E to the X. 1 over E to the X looks very similar to 1 over E to the X squared. And I'm actually right about this. That is actually larger, isn't it? It's less bottom heavy. Isn't that true? OK. So this might be a great choice. I just have to show that it was a great choice by doing this integral instead. And this is going to work out great. Uh, first thing I realized th is that it's uh, improper, right? So I need to clean that up a little bit. So I'm going to write LIM, B goes to infinity, integral from 1 to B, e to the negative x dx. Then I'm going to get LIM, B goes to infinity. Antiderivative is negative E to the negative X, 1 to B. Then I'm going to plug in the B and the 1. And it's negative 1 over E to the B minus negative 1 over E to the 1. I'll let my B go large. Goodbye, 1 over E to the B. Answer, 1 over E. Convergent. I have just proven 
that my purple area fits on a finite piece of paper. You see? By proving that this was finite, the function that lives beneath it is forced to be finite. If something is less than a number, it too is a number. Okay? Be careful not to use this logic too much. For example, if you prove that something is infinitely large, something that's less than that does not have to be finite. Okay? If I tell you I'm thinking of a number less than infinity, that does not mean, or if I'm thinking of something less than infinity, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm thinking of a finite value, you see? So be careful not to try to compare infinity to anything. But you would write a little sentence here. Okay, you guys have a fantastic weekend. Is this the shortest video you've ever done? Uh, well, because I cut out an example. Okay, so let's just write a quick sentence to summarize what we just concluded. It would go something like this. Integral of e to the minus x squared from 1 to infinity dx converges, that means it has area, a finite amount of area, because the integral from 1 to infinity of e to the minus x dx converged to 1 over e, and 0 is less than or equal to e to the minus x squared, which is in turn less than or equal to e to the minus x for all x. Okay? And again, the meaning of this, very simple. If one integral converges and you're dealing with an integral that yields even larger y coordinates all throughout its domain, then the one with the smaller y coordinates should converge as well. Okay, now you can also do this sort of in uh, kind of a contrapositive form. So you can say, listen, if I know there's an integral, let me draw another picture for you here. Let's say you're dealing with an integral, and you believe for some reason that this area is diverging. So you have your suspicions. You're thinking, I don't think this has a finite area, right? You could actually prove that by saying, hey, look, I've studied this other graph in the past, y equals 1 over x. And I know when I integrate y equals 1 over x from 1 to b and make b go big, this gives me ln b minus ln 1. And when I let b go large, that's infinite. So let me write that in here. This goes to infinity. So, Mr. Shore, you've given me this black curve that is even higher up the page than the purple one. I know this purple one has an infinite amount of area under it. Certainly, the black one will. That is sound logic. Okay, so you, basically what I'm saying is if your function, let's call your function f, uh, actually it would be the black one, excuse me. Okay, so the black one is f of x. You're studying that one today. But you've studied e to the x, uh, 1 over x in the past. You could say basically if f of x is greater than g of x for all x, we usually write that like this. And you know that the integral of g of x from a to infinity con uh, diverges. Then you would be sure that the integral of f of x from a to infinity diverges as well. Okay. What would be incorrect, I was saying a minute ago, what would be incorrect is to say, hey, I've got this um, divergent integral, and there's a curve under it. That means it's finite. No, if you're saying that something is less than infinite, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a finite value, if that makes sense. Okay? Um, you also can't use it to say, oh, I've got a convergent graph, and there's a curve above it. Well, then the, that doesn't mean the one above it's convergent. Okay. One last word about this topic here. It's pretty simple, but we require that if, let's say, we're dealing with 
a curve like this one. All right, this is f of x. And we want to see if it's convergent or not. So we're going to find the area, you know, between 1 and infinity. We're, we're wondering if this is finite or infinite amount of area. Um, we might wonder that question, and we might have our suspicions that this area, let's say, is finite. But we cannot seem to find a function that is above it, okay, that is convergent. So you try really hard to create a function, and the best, let's say, that you can come up with is this function. That wasn't very good, it needs to descend. Let's say you, the best thing you come up with is g of x equals e to the negative x squared. And you know that the area under the red curve is convergent. I will accept this as proof that f of x is convergent. You might say, well, why? Your black curve rises up above the red one. But as we go further out, that behavior stops. You can see that f, the black curve, is truly beneath g at some value. Okay? So it looks like right about here, maybe right at x equals 10, g suddenly becomes the upper curve and it stays that way. All right? So if you kind of go back in your rules, we are allowing a little bit here of flexibility right here in this rule that you wrote in blue. This just needs to be true um, after sum x or for x is greater than something. Okay? So it might be after x equals 10. G becomes the upper function and stays the upper function. You see? So we just have to determine if that behavior is true, and then we can use a conversion integral to prove a conversion integral, or a diverge integral to prove, prove a diverge integral. And that uh, is a very important chapter 9 concept. Have a good weekend.